Well, do you want to pause? <laughs> Fine with me. <laughs> Any uh, observations, questions? But yeah. keep it brief because I'm going to keep this very short yeah. discussion period. Yeah. Yes, sir. Then. So, so, John, once again, that was, that was stunningly depressing. So after a collective group therapy around climate, um, I, I can't resist trying to look at the, 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 uh, the silver lining in this sad story. And one of them is that we are already seeing, as you highlighted, climate refugees, internal conflicts that are made worse by this. So one of the places where I, uh, we've done some recent writing and I wonder what your thoughts would be is that we've been arguing to the UN that in the same way that we went to using dallies and other measures to try to understand, a concept like a PREC, a Peace Renewable Energy Credit, oh, yeah. a credit given by first donors but then governments to support investment with clean, quick to implement energy from Puerto Rico to areas in South Sudan and elsewhere where there is violence, that clean energy has a benefit that goes far beyond a, a social cost of carbon. Mm -hmm. And you illustrated that. And I wonder if one of the things that might come up, you know, you and Jeff, for example, could stand on stage and say, this is the way to get ahead of it. And country, some countries want to invest. Oh. But certainly the, the tie between conflict and um, and these environmental disasters is clear, and clean energy gets you ahead of that and will save a huge amount, but we're not doing the math today. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just a quick comment on that. No, I, I think in the end you will need both things. Uh, I guess at the COP23, which I will attend in two weeks from now, actually one starts in one week from now, uh, this will be something of the things to be considered clearly. I think you have to go both ways, really. You need to do something on the ground, if you like, uh, and, and a measure like, as if everybody can sort of weigh in, everybody can make a contribution. It's extremely important to have this, but, but I also do feel from my own experience that at the same time you have to create the institutions necessary, uh, the laws, whatever, the framework in which this is happening. And this Nansen password, for example, was an ingenious thing, it was only possible after the complete catastrophe of yeah. the First World War, right? because only in those times people are willing to reconsider uh, institutional uh, setup. So I guess, yes, everything you propose is absolutely important. It will help, but I hope it will also help to create pressure for institutional reform. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor. Well, uh, Echo the words, uh, very impressive. Uh, I, my question is about um, ethics. Um, those uh, who are on board of uh, the airplane that Rem uh, described and that you pointed out uh, don't know uh, that the uh, airplane is, is completely uh, out of fuel in a way. Um, so it's an ethical question, in my opinion. Uh, there are many places in here, I think, of the northeast of Brazil, which is drying up amazingly fast. And people just don't know that this is uh, a, a temporary phenomenon. Uh, and instead, it's, it's like a trend. So I think we have a communication issue again, uh, which is to inform these people that it's not an episodic event. It's a tragedy which is going to only get worse over time. And the problem is that they are not equipped uh, to design solutions to increase their resilience. Uh, traditional ethno-ecological or ethno-agricultural practices are not equipped to deal with these you know, major changes. So my question to you is, a, is an ethical one. How, do, how can we address mm. the fact that these people who have contributed the least to the problem are suffering the most, and this suffering is likely to increase, and they don't know, have no idea no, no. that this is coming. Should we take Jeff as well? Yeah. So let's go to Jeff, and then um, yeah. Yeah. we'll answer. Yeah, let's, let's take this. We're uh, often uh, 
talking about the carbon budget remaining for uh, achieving the Paris goals or achieving two degrees. Um, and I would like you to factor in for us uh, and help us to understand quantitatively. If we uh, consider the aerosol removal and the warming from that, if we consider the thermal inertia uh, that apparently uh, is also fractions of 1% uh, C, of, of 1 degree C, how do we have any carbon budget left uh, for uh, 2 degrees? We're usually told that we have maybe 750 billion or 800 billion tons of CO2 remaining. Uh, this is the normal statement of IPCC, and it's in climate change, uh, nature climate change, every couple of months. Something must not be right about those calculations uh, in view of these other forcings. And uh, given tipping points like drying of uh, the forests and uh, shifting perhaps from sinks to sources of CO2. Can the models uh, accommodate that and give us truly dynamic uh, carbon budgets, which may be zero at this point or negative? And so could you just give us some quantification of this? Because I, frankly, we need these numbers uh, more clearly defined. And the numbers we're using right now to express alarm are that we only have uh, 800 billion tons, but it sounds to me from this discussion that we don't have that. My God, this is a, <laughs> a difficult thing, but I have been involved in this for a while. So our rule of thumb more or less is when we talk about the carbon budget is about 600 billion tons of CO2 equivalent actually actually 600 billion tons CO2, and when you have to think, of course, of all the other things, methane, RAM, and others have made this point. I guess everything has to work together quite nicely if we are able to hold the Paris line, everything. That means including the short-lived pollutants we have been discussing so many times. We need to actually phase out uh, pollution, air pollution, also in a way that we do not get disruptive cleaning of the planet, which sounds completely bizarre, but it is true. Uh, and, of course, there are lots of uncertainty in this. Yeah? I mean, there was a paper recently calculating a gigantic carbon budget left. I think it's full of errors, really. But nevertheless, it made a contribution. But, you know, we have no choice, really. I mean, when the carbon budget was introduced, it was in particular a metaphor. Everybody understood that. We still do not know precisely where all the climate simulation always show that there is this linear relationship, actually. And it may turn out, if you include the feedbacks in particular, it's wrong. Huh? But for a while, it works. So it's a huge and very important metaphor. But we should not just be obsessed with it. I think. What we know absolutely clearly is the direction. The direction is reduce, reduce, reduce. Whether this will save the day in the end, we simply don't know. I cannot give you a guarantee. But I can give you a guarantee that we are all lost if we are not reducing, <laughs> reducing, reducing. So I think in the end, everything counts. Everything counts in terms of negative emissions by planting trees, for example. Uh, there was a very interesting paper recently showing that you can reduce or you can compensate 30% of the global emissions by better management of degraded ecosystems. So go for it. Uh, this is a win-win thing. So that's my comment, but Jeff, you're right. This is, I think some of our colleagues have made this discussion more complicated than they should have, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm coming back to a very, it's very deep, uh, very deep uh, observation by Professor Viana, the ethics. Um, the answer is capacity building, capacity building in a sense. It's our, and I say our now as a member of an industrialized country, Germany, it's our responsibility 
to tell people what we are doing to them, which is very hard, actually. Yeah? We need to frankly tell them that we are doing harm to them without them even knowing about it. We have to tell them, and we have to give them the capacity to understand what we are doing to them. This is, I think, a Christian attitude, definitely. Yeah? It's not a cost-benefit analysis. It's a deeply ethical conviction, a deep ethical uh, responsibility. And actually, I'm involved in a, in a major project, so just two illustrations when I'm done, Partha. Uh, one is a capacity building project funded by the German government in Tanzania, in Peru, in India, in Bangladesh, and in the Marshall Islands, where we will do precisely that. Because those people even come to a conference of the parties, climate, and we have no experts. Yeah? And the second is that, I mentioned this before, Germany is hosting now the COP23 on behalf of Fiji. We have worked with the small island states for a long time, and we try to help them to understand what is going on on this planet. But the same responsibility should apply to the Brazilian government to tell the people in, in the Northeast, uh, in the Sertão, and so on, what is happening to them. The same should apply to the African states and so on. Because it's true, we are in a way destroying the world, but 90% of the population of this planet do not even know what is going on. No? I think we, I think John deserves another.